So let's get into it. Um, today we have a bit of a pronunciation lesson. We're, we're going to get back to that after a second. Um, there's also some, yeah, some vocab stuff. Also some grammar. Cool. Okay, 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 okay. We will get into that. Is there any vocab for today? There should be a little bit of vocab. Okay, we're going to start with the vocab for today, and then we're going to get into the rest of the lessons. Uh, so let's start with, um, let's start with this. Uh, these words right here, these ones are to do with competition. I think a little bit like sports slash competition, uh, in general, some pretty good vocab, uh, a couple different, um, topics that you can use this in. Let's talk about the first word competition. This is a noun. Uh, it's basically, um, it's a noun that describes two things. Number one, you can use this to talk about like some kind of game or some kind of like, um, you know, uh, event some kind of like sport, like for example, the Olympics is a competition where everybody's trying to win the prize, right? Uh, and you can also use this to talk about, for example, if you're like a business, right? And you want to win, uh, like uh, you, you want to win over other businesses, those other businesses are called your competition. So for example, like McDonald's and, and, and Burger King, they are competition, like to each other, they're competing with each other. That's why they are competition. It's the same as like the word traffic where, uh, traffic is like the, the noun that describes like cars that are standing. So you can say that they are traffic. So it's the same. They are competition is that they are like enemies to each other. Compete is the verb form. Oh, sorry. Compete is the verb form of this. So it's like whenever you are trying to beat somebody, you are competing with them. Yeah. Compete, competing. Uh, remember competing is written like this. Competing, competing. Competitive, competitive. All these words, all three of them are pronounced a little bit different. Competition, compete, competitive. So competitive is a, an adjective that is used to describe somebody who really wants to win. Uh, basically, they're always looking to, you know, like be the best in something. Uh, so that, that, is, that is somebody who is competitive. Yeah. Okay, once again, I need to make sure that you guys can hear me. Please raise your hands in the chat if you can hear me right now. I got to make sure. I got to make sure you can hear me. Okay, good. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's great. Let's continue. Um, next is extremely competitive. I, actually, this is great. Uh, I think um, another way that you could say this is aggressively. Aggressively. Oh, aggressively is written with two Gs. I always forget that. Aggressively competitive. So this means like Somebody who basically really, really wants to win. They're very, very competitive. You can use extremely or aggressively. Those are both great adjectives, great collocations with the word competitive. Let's continue. Competitive by nature. This is another great... Uh, this is actually um, idiomatic language, which is also good uh, to talk about somebody who really wants to win. Basically, somebody who's naturally competitive. Like, they're born competitive, basically. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. In competition all my life is used to describe a person. Like, for example, there's a lot of people that their parents make them play chess, football, basketball, any kind of sport, right? So those people are in competition all their life. As soon as they're born from the moment until, you know, they stop playing, basically, or from the moment that they're talking, like right now, they have always played some kind of sports. They've always wanted to win. So that is uh, one way that you can describe those kinds of people, they have been in competition all of their lives. So that's also a quite cool phrase. I recommend you to use it, uh, depending on the situation, of course, but just, um, th these, these words are less about like being always usable and more about being usable in the exact situation, which is competition. Like if you get any kind of topic like this, then you have a lot of really cool vocab that you can use to be up for a good challenge. This means somebody who really really wants to do some kind of like sport activity, something like that. Who, somebody who really wants a challenge, uh, they are up for the challenge, basically. Yeah. Uh, next is partake. Uh, partake means to participate, to do something, to, to take. Uh, this is actually, one second, let me, let me take part in something. Partake is basically the same as take part in something. Partake, take part. I think you kind of understand how that similarity is similar. Yeah. Uh, let's continue. Face off. <coughs> Apologies. Uh, face off means to fight somebody or to at least compete with somebody, like to go head to head. Actually, I'm going to write that down. Go, go head to head. I think you kind of also understand like head 
to head, like you're fighting, you know, with your heads, I guess, with your brains. So uh, all of these are basically ways to say compete with somebody, fight with somebody, try to try to beat somebody. So yeah, jump at the opportunity. I think we already talked about about this. Basically, jump at the opportunity means to try to do something as soon as you get the chance. So like when you have the chance to to do something, you do it immediately. You jump at the opportunity to play football. So like as soon as you can go play some football, you go and do it. Next is to encourage competition. This means to motivate uh, other people or just motivate somebody to be more competitive. So for example, like you can say that a school encourages competition by giving good students less homework. So it's like students try to be better than each other, I guess. Yeah. Uh, victory is a noun, which is talking about like winning. Um, and somebody who wins is called Victor, which I think is funny. Yeah, Victor. Uh, let's continue. Triumph. Triumph means like a very big victory, very big achievement. Like, uh, you know, whenever you like win something, it's not necessarily a triumph. But if you are having like a very difficult time, it's very hard for you to win. Something was very hard and you won like very in a very difficult way, then that is called a triumph. And another way that you can kind of look at this is like something that society has achieved. So, for example, like you can say that the Internet is a triumph because of like how difficult it was to create it. Like something that's very difficult is a triumph basically. Now, next is silverware. Uh, silverware has two meanings. It's a trophy made out of like a precious metal, gold, silver, anything like that. But also silverware is actually a noun, which just means like spoons, forks, knives, the things in your kitchen, like the things that you eat with, those are called silverware also. Incentive. Incentive is something that motivates and encourages people to do something. Uh, just cool phrase. Um, it's it's um, it's a good phrase. It's a good phrase. Like a, like a motivation for something uh, or something that encourages you. Something that encourages you. Uh, you can also have the something called financial incentive, which means like some kind of reason in terms of money. So you're going to get paid. So if you're going to get paid for something, then you have a financial incentive. Uh, let's continue. Stimulates growth basically means to to make somebody grow, develop, make somebody like you know try to try to get better. Um, and healthy competition means uh, do 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 do. Healthy competition is like a good form of competition. So whenever people are trying to win, but they're not necessarily trying to like you know kill each other, and they're not trying to make everybody you know feel bad for some reason. Uh, that's called healthy competition. So like, for example, if you and your best friend both really want to get better at English, and so you keep learning and practicing and learning and practicing, and you practice together, for example, then that is healthy competition because it's good for both of you. Um, these two are kind of similar. Let's talk about these. Spark a passion means to cause some kind of person to become passionate about something. Ignite a fire means to... <sighs> to start some kind of like conflict or to start to start something basically it can be negative or it can be positive you can say that i'm going to ignite the fire of this business i guess you could say and then that make, means that the business is going to like start growing very quickly or you can say like that uh, that lit a fire uh between the people something something that means that like like uh, in a negative way, everybody disliked it or everybody wasn't happy or there was some kind of conflict between everybody. So that is, that is what ignite a fire means. Um, do, 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 do. Okay. We have quite a lot more vocab. Let's continue, I guess. Added bonus. Uh, great vocab. It basically means like some kind of extra, some kind of addition, something like uh, so something that you didn't necessarily deserve, but you just got like for free. So for example, like, um, I think it just makes sense. Some kind of like some some kind of extra addition, some kind of bonus. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Bring out. Ooh, this is actually really nice. So bring out basically means like to be a situation that causes somebody to change in some way. And usually in all these situations, it means like some kind of positive way. So for example, um, the competition brought out a lot of talents. It brought out a lot of skills or like we need to bring out his skills if he wants to win. It means that you need to like develop your skills basically. So bring out means to, to develop and also to show like that kind of, yeah. So cool. Bring out is a pretty cool, cool phrase, cool, like, um, phrasal verb. And you can use this for the word skills, for talents, for gifts, for creativity, a lot of different stuff. 
extra effort. One second. Extra effort is, uh, I think, kind of makes sense. It means like additional uh, trying to do something, some kind of um, some kind of passion that you have, and you're putting that passion into doing something. And a synonym for that is to go the extra mile. This means like to go further, to go longer than you should. You are going to put in more work than other people. So this is a great phrase, especially to talk a bit about sports. It's it's cool. So yeah, good phrases in general. Uh, let's continue. Um, okay, all those don't matter. Nurture confidence. So nurture confidence. In general, the word nurture means like to grow something. So you can use this to talk about plants. You can use this to talk about a business, about anything. Like whenever you're growing something and something is becoming bigger, you are nurturing it. So in this case, if you say to nurture confidence, it means to make somebody's confidence better, to grow somebody's confidence. Uh, next is drive. It's about drive. It's about power. We stay hungry. We devour. Put in the work. Put in the hours and take what's ours. Uh, sorry. That's a good song, by the way. You should listen to that song if you're going to get this topic. But anyway, yeah. Uh, drive basically means like your um, inner, which means from the inside. It, it, inner and innate are actually similar. I'm going to write that down. Um, from the inside, you have like this this drive, this reason, this push from the inside. Like you're, you're pushing to try to do something. So, for example, drive to earn money, drive to um, – uh, get some kind of goal, some kind of achievement. So to basically drive means like you wanting to do something. Um, spirit of competition. <coughs> My apologies. Uh, spirit of competition means like the whole idea like of sportsmanship, basically. Let me actually write that down. Sportsmanship. Sportsmanship is like the idea of being a good competitor. So for example, not breaking other drivers cars like if you're a race car if you're a racer like you know nascar formula one right um the spirit of competition says that you shouldn't break other drivers cars but if you don't have good sportsmanship then you will break their cars because you don't care basically yeah rise to challenges or rise to the challenge rise to the challenge Great phrase, great like kind of idea. Uh, it, it's it's basically an idiomatic kind of phrase idea. It means to try to um, apologies to try to win, right? So, for example, if you have some kind of uh, difficult situation, right, and you try to win in the situation, you try to solve the problem, then you are rising. Oh my God, what's wrong? Uh, it means like you are rising to the challenge. So you are trying your best to like go through your problems or act in response to like a difficult situation basically. So yeah, under pressure, this means that there's a very stressful environment. A lot of things are happening around you. Things are difficult and you are, uh, you, you have like some kind of deadline, for example, and you really need to work a lot. That means that you are under pressure. Uh, pressure as a whole means like, uh, for example, if you have like, you have the ground, right? And then under the ground, there's like some kind of object. All of the ground on top is pushing on that object, and that's called pressure. Or like if you're pushing on somebody, then that is also pressure. Usually it's not a physical thing. It's more of a um, like a mental, like a psychological thing, I guess. Yeah. Let's continue. Academic competition. Uh, academic competition is talking about like students trying to win, students trying to become faster, students trying to become smarter. Uh, that's called academic competition. In general, the word academic is a great phrase. I'm going to underline it. It means like, uh, connected to academia, connected to learning. So good phrase. Let's continue. Unsportsmanlike. Uh, unsportsmanlike is connected to not having good sportsmanship. So the opposite of uh, sportsmanship is unsportsmanlike. Yeah, cool words. Sportsmanship, unsportsmanlike. Yeah. Um, strive against adversity. In general, the word adversity is a great word. Adverse... Uh, adverse with an E. I'm going to write that down right here. Adverse means like very um, difficult. So very difficult situation. You can say adverse life circumstances. Uh, striving against adversity means to go through all of your problems. Even though you have all these problems, you're still going through them and you're moving forward. Uh, and lastly, yeah, sportsmanship. I think that makes sense. Coping with a loss. Uh, coping as a whole means like dealing with something. So whenever you have some kind of like emotional trouble, emotional problem, and you are dealing with it, then you are coping with the problem. So, all right. 
Uh, that is it for the vocab part of today. There's still a couple of words. I'd recommend you to learn all of these. Uh, I'm going to show you a video on the topic of competition. Let me choose which one, if you give me one moment for that. Uh, we're going to be watching it, and then we're going to be discussing it a little bit. I'm going to tell you a bit about it. Um, doo -doo 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 -dee -doo -doo. Also, my nose is completely dead. I cannot breathe at all. I don't know if you guys can hear it, but, like, I'm speaking, like, from here, right? But, like, not from here at all. It sounds terrible. And this was this is the same way I've been speaking, like, all of today. I feel so bad. It's It's terrible. Uh, yeah. Also, I cannot hear anything. Oh, it's 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 just not fun at all. Okay. Um, do 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 do. I know what video we're gonna be talk watching. Uh, this is this is one of my favorite videos actually. Uh, okay. We're I'm gonna play this video. Here we go. It's gonna be Vox once again. I think I think Vox is a really cool place to find a lot of these kinds of videos. So let's get into it. I'm gonna share my screen and uh, yeah, it's gonna be like a couple minutes, fi fi around five minutes. Uh, let's let's watch it. Okay, uh, I'm gonna turn on the video and then I'm gonna go blow my nose like like that so that I don't have to speak like this. And then I'll come back and we'll c continue discussing. So yeah, okay, 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 okay. here we go. Okay, I'm going to play the video. After I play the video, raise your hand if you can hear it. In 1908, Olympics found... Okay, can you hear that? Did you guys hear that? Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. So, let's get into watching the video, and then after a couple minutes, after it's over, I'll be back. Uh, the subtitles are here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's get into it. In 1908, Olympics founder Pierre de Coubertin spoke the phrase that would become the Olympic creed. The important thing in life is not the triumph, but the fight. The essential thing is not to have won, but to have fought well. This is the fight. This is race walking. Why are they walking like that? This is an Olympic event where men and women walk 20 kilometers, 12.4 miles, and men go as far as 50 kilometers, 31 miles, and the best go at less than 7 miles seven minutes it's hypnotic and and very uh you know with all that hip action it's very it's very dancey they look like they're rushing to the bathroom tell them do we know why they walk like that bill we're in luck we do know why they're walking like that <laughs> people study this there are actually dozens of papers about race walking i talked to one researcher who wrote his phd thesis on the biomechanics of the race walk he has studies with names like kinematic characteristics of elite men's 50 kilometer race walking this is this is some serious science here okay so they actually study why race walkers walk like that yeah they don't study it they track it this little tron like thing that is on the screen with the race walker this is an actual top race walker who they've studied how she walks yeah this is a top race walker they are tracking her every articulation of the joint they're 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 seeing what makes her go so fast while walking there's a good reason why they walk like that they're pushing their bodies to the extreme they have to conform to one very important number 230.2 what is 230.2 you don't know 230.2 no what is 232 <laughs> it is the rule of race walking what researcher brian hanley explained there's one rule uh it's rule 230.2 judges use rules to make sure people are walking not running there's a big difference so one part states that you uh have can't have any visible loss of contact with the ground so if one foot is kind of in the air like this, then another has to be on the ground, or at least to the human eye? Yeah, walkers can trick the judges for about 40 milliseconds. So, you know, when you're running, there's a, this point where you have no feet on the ground. It's kind of crazy when if you watch that in like a, a slow motion of how people run, there's we're kind of like jumping from one foot to the other. Judges are looking out for this. They call it flight time and it's illegal. And judges do boot people out. So it's kind of like traveling in basketball. Sometimes these guys will take an extra step, and if the ref doesn't catch it or call it, it just means they're a good player. It means they know what they're doing. You figured it out. Yeah. It's all about that. If the, if the, if the judges can't see, flight time flies. And the other rule is that the knee must be straightened from 
when you make oh. first contact with the ground until it passes under your body. Okay, so it looks like they almost kind of lock their knee. That's what gives it its sort of unusual look. The speed of your walk is your stride length times your stride frequency. So you can take long steps or fast steps. Ideally, you're going to do both. But race walkers have a limited stride length. They can't jump. They can't bend their knee. They can't run. So they have to figure ways to step faster. They rotate their pelvis like this. So that helps them get longer steps. Okay. And they also drop their hips down lower. It will keep your center of mass low. So you don't end up with a bouncing motion. You kind of end up with a smooth motion. It does look really smooth. If you just look at their upper body, it's just a straight line. There is no bouncing. They walk in a very straight line. Race walkers put their feet in a straight line. Good analogy is like a tightrope. It helps them do that rotation of the pelvis. It, it makes their, their, their steps longer. So basically these walkers figured out how to fit the rules and make walking more efficient. But more efficient ends up looking kind of weird. That looks weird to you. But this is strategy. <laughs> The best athletes look for an edge. Bicyclists drift to reduce wind resistance, wrestlers dehydrate to lower their weight class, and race walkers... They wiggle. Okay, I got it. I have one more question. Oh, fine. Okay, so is this actually fun to watch? Yeah, it actually is because it's so cutthroat and exhausting. Plus, there's this. But it's really interesting as well because you, you never know who's going to win because they could always get disqualified. So it makes it more exciting than a running race. You can see the real sort of human struggle in it. And we can learn things from this struggle. Race walkers are walking differently um, because they've got these rules. It forces them to walk a different way and that can teach us more about normal people walking. We're all walking based on rules. Rules are body sets. The way we're built. Like the bounce in this guy's step. How this woman swings her arm. Like that's the excitement of sports. You're giving people these absurd, sometimes really absurd rules, these confines to work within. And we know what the rules are. The drama is how people deal with them. All right. So yeah, that is that is one more. Yellow. Uh, my internet died again. Anyway, yeah, so that, that is one of my favorite videos from Vox as a whole. I, I think it's just really funny. I don't know why. It's it's like, it's it's a cool video, but also kind of a comedic video because you're just seeing these, like, men just, like, walking like this. It looks really funny. Uh, but, yeah, um, there were a couple cool words in there. I think a lot of, like, academic words, uh, especially connected to this topic. So hopefully you got a chance to... Uh, to hear some of that, and in general, uh, there are going to be some videos for this topic, so I think you should watch them uh, whenever whenever the time comes. Uh, today, let's get into the two topics that we have, which is the pronunciation lesson uh, and also the grammar lesson. The the two main things you should learn a lot from this lesson. I'm going to send the like the, the 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 file into the group. You should read it again, maybe two or three times. It's it's a very important lesson today. Pronunciation. Uh, let's kind of read this paragraph together. This is like the four word. I, I think all of you understand this, but I just want to read it so we kind of have a basis for where we're coming from here. Uh, we all have a mother tongue, which functions as a filter for what sounds we are able to distinguish, which means like what sounds we can see, what sounds we can hear. When you learn a foreign language, you have to understand that it uses a different set of sounds and different orthographic rules than your mother tongue, i.e. the same letter written in a different language may be pronounced differently. What learners often do is that they try to approximate the sounds by the ones they're already familiar with and read words as if they were written in their native la languages. Here's a list of the most common errors of this type. So we're, we're going to talk about this. Uh, basically, what, what this means is like a lot of times, right, students, they see some kind of word and they read it with the same rules as in their own language. And especially, for example, like in, in Uzbek, uh, there's a lot of very common pronunciation mistakes. And this is actually why, like, whenever you're learning Tesla or where, whenever you're learning any kind of like uh, you know, teaching methodology, they teach you how to work with every single language uh, differently. Like whenever you're teaching Chinese students, you're going to have the same techniques always. You're going to be using the same kind of rules and the same kind of teaching uh, because they all have the same problems. And it's the same for Uzbek students. Uh, and so basically, um, we're going to be going over some of the most common problems and just in general, the things that we <clears throat> need to understand about pronunciation. One thing that you should keep in mind, and actually this is kind of important as a whole. So this phrase right here, 
We all have a mother tongue which filters, which functions as a filter for what sounds we're able to distinguish. This is actually not just about sounds. This is about a lot of things. Your language actually impacts the way that your brain not only functions, but also the way that your brain forms. It's been proven, like, you know, in Russian, they have, uh, I think, like six or uh, I think seven colors. Uh, they have light blue, which is, which is like, a, they have a separate word for that. So they have one more color than the rainbow in English. Right. And because of this, it's actually been proven that literally people that speak Russian as a native language, they can see more color than uh, English speakers. And actually, if you go back uh, languages, there's a lot of different languages, like uh, historical languages, like languages note is spoken mainly by native peoples. Those languages only have colors like, you know, light, dark and red. Of course, red because of blood and light and dark because of, you know, the sky and, and the ground, I guess. Um, and, and these are the only three colors that they have. And because of that, it's very difficult for them to actually distinguish the differences in all those colors. They don't have words for those colors. Of course, when they learn another language, they can describe all of them. But seeing it is much more difficult for them than for other people that speak other languages. So if it pertains to light and to color, I think it would make a lot of sense that this is the same rule when we're talking about sounds. Whenever you hear sounds, you filter them through your own native language and you try to understand them through your own native language. So, let's get into it. Uh, here are some common mistakes. A-U in English is pronounced as ah uh, or o. Oh. There's, there's a couple different pronunciations. Ah in law. So, it's like ah. You kind of have an open mouth, open ah. Uh, and not as ow. Uh, so, for example, we don't say auto. We say auto. So, let's, let's actually pronounce these words. Let's do this. I'm, I'm going to make bold the words that we're going to be practicing pronouncing. So autobiography, autopsy. Um, is that it? Yeah, that's it. Autobiography, autopsy. You can actually see it here. Autopsy or aut Hello? Can you guys hear me? My internet keeps dying. It's unfortunate. Uh, okay, let's let's continue. Uh, P.S. at the beginning of the word is pronounced just as S. So, for example, we never say psychology. We always say psychology. Same with this word. We say pseudonym. Or in Britain, they say pseudonym. 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 Yeah, the British people. <laughs> British people. <laughs> yeah. Um, in America, we say... Uh, pseudonym with no with no y, just pseudonym. Uh, next, let's get to eu. Uh, as uh, u, just just u. So, for example, this is not uh, pneumatic. This is pneumatic. So, just pneumatic, pneumatic, uh, and this is pronounced as Euclid. Just Euclid. How do they say it in Britain? Jew. I I a Jew. <laughs> pneumatic. Oh, this is a, this is a yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's a, that's a pneumatic, pneumatic. I have no idea, guys. I hate British people. I will kill every British person. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, let's continue. So Euclid and pneumatic. This is just a a u like like u. Next is the word uh the, the letters k n. Oh, also these two, pneumonia, pneumonia. Yeah, there we go. That makes sense. Pneumonia, pneumonia. Okay, cool, cool. KN. KN is never pronounced as kn. It's always pronounced just as n. The K is silent. So, for example, knee, knife, and no. Never kno, never kni, never knife. Always no. <coughs> Next is the, the letter X at the beginning of the word. These words are quite uh, rare, but still important to know. The X at the beginning is never pronounced as. Um, it's never pronounced as KS or never pronounced as X. It's always pronounced as Z. So for example, xenophobia, Xena, uh, always with a, with a Z, just a very hard Z. That's it. Uh, w and V are two very, very important rules. And this is something that a lot of students don't see, right? They, they just think that you can change them. You cannot change them. They're never going to be like same. They're never going to mix their pronunciations. Always W is what? V is always V, very hard. So V is always hard, W is always soft. Uh, for example, let's look at this word. Very, 
very, we never say wary. We always say very. It's, it's, the word wary is actually a different word. So why this is actually important, right? It's important because if you say the wrong pronunciation, you're going to be actually saying a different word. This is why you have a mark for pronunciation on your IELTS test, on your speaking, because for your speaking test, right? And, and, and why I have been teaching you all this right now is because this is important for your speaking test. You're going to get a bad score if the examiner is listening to you and they can hear you say a different word. The, the, the key thing and the, the most important word, I think the one that I really like to show students uh, is the word clothes. Uh, I have, it's very difficult to find Uzbek students who can say this word correctly. The correct way to say this word is clothes. So it goes from, <coughs> it goes from clo to the, to S seamlessly. So it goes clothes, just this, there's no E, you never say clothes and you never say closes. These are different words. So the word, the word closes is not correct. It's not the right way to actually say the word. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, basically, if you say the word with the wrong pronunciation, it can sound like a different word. And so if we go back to this word, very is actually different from the word wary. Wary means like careful or uh, worried, basically. So, yeah. Uh, the, word, uh, the word with the W is like a, like a, like a wow. Uh, so we never say this as va vav. Wow, that sounds like something like a German would say. Yeah, uh, vest and west are completely different. So vest is like a jacket that you wear, kind of like a small, like without the hands. While west is like you know northeast, southwest, like on a on a compass. Uh, when you say w, you have to make a narrow slit in your mouth, so it's like like that, like a small line. Uh, when you say when you say v, you make a like a v like a vibration with your teeth and your bottom lip. So yeah. Uh, do, do, de, do, do, do. Let's continue. Uh, this is one of the most important lessons. I, I, I would say I'm just going to like just very wary um, vest and west. Try to kind of practice these and make sure that you're saying these correctly. These are very important. Let's continue. CH. Um, yes, 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 yes. Okay. <clears throat> uh, okay, here we go. So here are the the words where we hear ch. Um, in English, most of the time that we see ch, it's either going to be ch, like a hard ch, or a k. There's no rules to know which one, so you just have to practice. So, for example, this is going to be chat, chalk, and chapter. Whereas this is going to be character, chrome, and orchestra. You never say orchestra, and you never say kolk. That's incorrect. You also don't say captor. You say chapter. Um, there are a lot of rules in different languages. So, for example, in English, uh, like chef, right? You say this as chef with like a with like a c uh, s s h rather than a c h. You say chef, not chef. Um, but most of the rules are. Um, most of the words are going to be ch or k, so chat or character. Let's continue. Uh, e. E is non, in non syllables, is often pronounced as i, as i in pit, especially in words beginning d, such as detective. Okay. Detective, delay, delete, mm -hmm. decorate. Okay, yeah, that's cool. Uh, so basically, what's what they're saying here is there's there's two ways to pronounce e. So whenever you have words starting with de, um, where de is non-stressed, so detective is detective. Uh, this sounds as eh, so it's detective. Whereas if it's stressed in the word decorate, uh, decorate, yeah, decorate, detective. Detective. What? One second. In Nostra Soldo, it's often pronounced as I, as I in pits, especially when it's beginning with DE, which is detective. Delay. Decorate. What? What? My Sorry, my brain turned off for a second there. Delete. Oh, okay, there we go. Okay, let me just show you this one. So, delete, uh, DE is, is not stressed, so that's why it sounds as D, but this sounds as E, delete. 
so these are two different pronunciations. This is stressed. This is not stressed. Okay. Yeah. I don't know why they put decorate here. Decorate. Delete. What? Okay. We'll, we'll get back to that. That's not very important. Let's continue. TH. Uh, this one is something that students make a mistake with a lot. Let's talk about this real quick. There's two different sounds for TH. Uh, how do you know the difference between these two sounds and like how, how do you kind of see this? Uh, stressed, uh, sorry, not stressed, voiced and unvoiced. These are the two types of sounds. So in English, when you have a vowel, uh, vowel like A, E, I, O, U, uh, or sorry, no, no, not vowel, any sound, any sound, it can be either voiced, which means you use your vocal cords and your throat vibrates, or you do not use your voice and your vocal cords are like straight, right? Like another way to look at this is uh, sounds that are made with air. So like, or sounds that are made with vibrations like, so how you can actually test this is you can take your two fingers and you put them on your throat and then actually please do this with me so that you can see the difference. So right now, take your two fingers, put them on your throat and you can say, uh, like in the word, in the word, that, that you're going to feel your throat vibrating. You're going to, you're going to see that it's like, it, it feels different that, whereas if you say the word, um, one second, let me see which one it is. If you say the word, uh, those, though, th those, no, uh, throat. Throat. Oh, the word throat, for example. Yeah. Throat. Throat. In that word, you use the silent TH, the, the unvoiced. And so because of that, you don't feel the vibration. So the word that, it's vibrating. The word uh, throat, it's not vibrating. So it's also TH, the same letters in the alphabet, but it's a completely different sound. Uh, yes. So this one is pronounced as T, and this one is pronounced as D. Uh, yes, 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 yes. The flesh of everything you pronounce as a Z. Yes, 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 yes. Also, they are not pronounced as S and Z. Yeah, that's it. That kind of makes sense. So you never say like, you know, uh, you never say uh, uh, that and you never say those. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Let's skip this. A lot of these mistakes are also the same for German speakers. A lot of German speakers make a mistake with this. And there's there's a there's a commercial, but but yeah. Anyway, I'll show you that. I'll show you guys that later. Um, let's talk about one more letter that is quite often a mistake, uh, which is O. So, for example, uh, if we look at this, these words: vote. Oh, wait, I'm not supposed to underline them. Vote, hope. Uh, do 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 do. Uh, these ones as well. Okay. Perfect. I underlined them again. Apologies. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Ah, okay. Perfect. Um... Yes, the word O. Let's talk about it. How do we actually pronounce the word O? So a lot of words we say O as two vowels, two sounds. So one is like O and the other one is U. This is called a diphthong. That's a, it's a completely different sound uh, because there's, there's two sounds at the same time. So it's like O. So we say vote, oat, hope. Uh, but other times it is going to be more of a like um, one sound and it's going to be like an open uh, ah. So it's going to be like hot, God. Pot. Uh, in this case, the the ah is like open, uh, and it's similar to o oh in a lot of European languages. Uh, yeah, father, hot father. Yeah, so it, it's the same as the sound. It's it's kind of like between o and a, and this is the sound that's used for a lot of words. This one right here. It's not necessarily an a. It's not necessarily an o. It's somewhere in the middle. So it's like hot pot etc. Uh, yes. Uh, da, 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 da. <coughs> apologies. Uh, yeah. Next is the pronunciation of the word O in the word come. So here we say, we say come with, with, with a, ah, uh, this is like an open sound. Uh, it's also the same as the one in the word, but yeah, that's it. 
basically for these words, just learn to pronounce them. That's about it. There's not a many. Not, there's not many rules for them. Uh, let's practice the pronunciation for some of these words. Oh, actually, wait, no, no. These are all the words. Aha. Okay. These are all the words where O is pronounced as A. Uh. Basically, just learn this list. Let's say a couple of them anyway. Among. So I'm going to say them. I want you to say them after me. Among. Another. Brother. Color. Come. Comfortable. Comfortable. The way I say it is comfortable. So I just, I remove that and I say comfortable. Yeah, comfortable. Company. Cover. Done. Okay, and let's finish on that. Uh, yeah, that's about it for the pronunciation thing. These are the mistakes that uh, Uzbek students most often make. Uh, and just in general, things that you need to know. Uh, re go through this list once again and practice all of the words in bold. And you can listen back to this audio tape uh, in order to help you with that. Let's get on to some of the grammar for today. Um, today we're going to be talking about differences between simple sentences, compound sentences, complex, and complex compound sentences. Uh, these are the four types of sentences that you can make from combining different kinds of clauses. Uh, before we do talk about sentences, we do need to talk a little bit about clauses. Uh, let's see if that's here. Is that here? Is that here? Is that here? Okay, yeah, it's here. Okay, so we're going to get to that. Let's start with simple sentences. So basically, um, what is the difference between all the different types of sentences? They have different rules in terms of how many uh, subjects and objects they have, but also whether or not they are subordinate or, uh, sorry, not subordinate, uh, whether or not they are dependent or independent. We're going to talk about that. First, let's look at subjects and verbs. Uh, so simple sentences, that, those are the only things that they require. Some verbs always require you to have an object. So, if, for example, the word use, use what? You always need to say use what? So use it, use that, use the computer, something, something. Uh, but otherwise, if you have a verb that doesn't need any object, you can say, like, she ran. So just subject verb. And that is a complete sentence. You don't need anything else in that sentence. Uh, and your sentence can have more than one subject and verb. So, for example, you can say... Computers and other technological devices are important. You don't even even you don't need in the modern world in order to make a grammatically correct sentence. This is correct. So computers and other technological oh, computers and other technological devices are important. This is the verb in this situation. So uh, yeah, you can just say like ran, and this is also a correct sentence because listen, all you need is a subject. So this is the subject. This is called a compound subject. Compound because there's two subjects, two words, computers and devices. Technological is like other technological devices. This is like one word. It's like an adjective. Uh, this together is an adjective, basically. So other technological devices. Uh, let's continue. Subject, subject, verb. This is, this is the formula for this. Yeah, cool. Uh, so those are simple sentences. That kind of makes sense. These are the sentences that you usually use. Simple, no worries. You can also have two verbs. So you can say, like, you know, uh, I search for information. I search and play games on my computer. Uh, remember, you need to have, like, an object, right? Um, you could just say, like, she ran and cried. That's it. So she is the subject. Ran and cried are the two verbs. Neither of them require an object, which is why I can just say she ran and cried. But here you need an object because I searched for what? Uh, you don't need an object. You can just say, I search. I search and play, play what? Play games on my computer. Lastly, two subjects and two verbs. Simple, easy, makes sense. A lot of variation with this already simple kind of grammar rule. Let's move on to compound sentences. Compound sentences are uh, sentences that have two clauses. So what we looked at here, like subject plus verb, this is basically called a clause. This is like one part of the sentence. We can take these to combine them together using the words for and nor but or yet so, otherwise called fanboys. Fanboys is a um, list of coordinating conjunctions. So there's also uh, subordinating conjunctions, which are a little bit different, but coordinating conjunctions are the words that are used to combine simple sentences together to make compound sentences. So a compound sentence is not complex, but it has two like simple sentences together in one, uh, and it contains a more difficult idea. So for example... Subject verb, but subject verb. Computers are important, but they can be dangerous too. So we must be careful. This is actually already three, 
right? As you can see. Oh, oh wait, 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 wait. Computers are important, but they can be dangerous too. Yeah, there we go. Cool, 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 cool. You cannot say this. Computers are used widely in most countries now, and they are a sign of progress, and we must ensure everyone, everyone's has access to them. Everyone's. That's a mistake. So subject plus verb and subject plus verb and subject plus verb is incorrect. That makes sense. So how you could say this is, computers are used widely in most countries now, and they are a sign of progress. Full stop. We must ensure everyone has access to them. Yeah, so cool. You can also say, computers are used widely in most countries now, and they are a sign of progress. So we must ensure everyone has access to them. Okay, cool. So this is this is good. This is nice. Keep in mind, you always need to have a comma between every single one of your clauses. This is for writing as well as for speaking. Uh, if you remember, this means that while you're speaking, you need to take a pause. Like pauses in your speech are not just, you know, something for fun. It is necessary. You need to take pauses. And so whenever you're speaking, this is how this would sound. Computers are used widely in most countries now, and they're a sign of progress. So we must ensure everyone has access to them. Full stop. So you can literally hear me take the pauses. Don't just continue speaking. Take a pause. Imagine that you are like writing something. Uh, do, 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 do. We're going to talk a bit about semicolons, but this is better for, uh, this is better for writing rather than, rather than for, for, for speaking. So we're going to forget that for right now. Let's move on to complex sentences. Uh, do, 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 do. <sighs> Sorry. Throat death. So uh, let's take a look at it. Let's get over it. Let's let's get into it. Let's get into the topic. Complex sentences. Uh, complex sentences are more difficult than just compound sentences because they are uh, they're more complicated and they have a more difficult idea. They're trying to represent and show something a little bit more difficult. Whenever you have a compound sentences, compound sentence, uh, it is going to be different ideas that are connected in the same sentence for some kind of reason, just for whatever reason, right? For example, here, 